12 changed America and the world. Attacks by members of friendly nations. You were with us, or you were the terrorists. Unleashed a global war on terror. They will either succeed in changing our way of life, or we'll succeed in changing theirs. But ten years later, as the Arab Spring creates a new momentum, sidelining U.S. intervention and war in the region, is it time for America to move out of the shadows of 9-11? Assalamu alaikum. This is him. Hello and welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara. On September 12, America woke up baffled and looking for answers. But a battered Washington was already obsessing about retribution and mandated the Bush administration to wage a war on terror above and beyond the call of reason. Like a pyromaniac fireman, it went to fight fire with so much firepower, the tragic 9-11 attacks paled in comparison. Those daring to ask bold questions were treated as soft liberals, Muslim lovers, even Al-Qaeda apologists. Soul searching was deemed counterproductive, criticism unpatriotic. You're either for the Bush war or against America. Ten years later, many questions remain unanswered. What are the lessons, if any, learned from the debacle of 9-11 and 9-12? To help me answer these questions, I am joined by Chas Freeman former ambassador to Saudi Arabia and author of, most recently, America's Misadventures in the Middle East. And Bob Grenier, former CIA counterterrorism director, Islamabad station chief and agency veteran for 27 years. John Esposito, professor of religion and international affairs at Georgetown University and author of Unholy War, Terror in the Name of Islam, amongst many others. And last but not least, Peter Beinart, associate professor of journalism and political science at the City University of New York and author of The Good Fight, Why Liberals and Only Liberals Can Win the War on Terror and Make America Great Again. But first, let's start with some of the facts the Bush administration tried to conceal all along. With those words, George Bush began the war on terror, focusing the world's attention in one direction, toward Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, and then Iraq, not where it logically should have gone. There's clear evidence that um, the Bush administration and President Bush personally did not want the hardest part, the clearest part of the information gathered indicating Saudi involvement in 9-11 to come out. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers that day were Saudi, but the White House would rather you didn't know this. In fact, it deliberately hushed it up. The last 28 pages, the last chapter, if you like, of the Congressional Joint Inquiry report have been totally redacted, suppressed, censored. The real story of 9-11 didn't begin in New York on a bright September day. began in Kabul, Christmas Eve, 1979. The Soviet Union sends 30,000 troops into Afghanistan in an ill-fated attempt to secure the country and its oil pipelines for the Kremlin. Washington sees an opportunity, and President Jimmy Carter approves a covert plan, Operation Cyclone, to fund local rebel militias. Before long, the White House finds a partner willing to match its financing in the House of Saud. To keep this all secret, the millions handed over to these fighters was funneled through Pakistan's intelligence service, the ISI. Why were these countries so willing to work together? Because a mere six weeks before the Soviet invasion, the world witnessed this. 52 American hostages, blindfolded and paraded before the cameras. International humiliation for Washington. The final confirmation of the success of the Iranian revolution and crucially, a new regime openly hostile to Riyadh. 
the U.S. and Saudi Arabia now found themselves politically and diplomatically in total agreement. And the rationale for being so was obvious. Because of oil, because the oil card is, is the eighth. It had been paramount since the Second World War when President Roosevelt sat down on a U.S. warship with the King of Saudi Arabia and essentially made the, the Faustian deal of, over oil that has lasted from then until now. And once that deal was struck, it forced the hand of American foreign policy in the region for decades. Even though, as in the case of Afghanistan, Washington failed to realize the long-term consequences, or if it did, chose to ignore them. Ronald Reagan's misunderstanding of the region was so clouded by the Cold War that when he invited Mujahideen leaders to the White House in 1985, he told the American people they were, quote, the moral equivalent of our founding fathers. It wasn't until many years later that Pakistan's former president was honest enough to admit the shared culpability. We helped create the Mujahideen, he said, armed them, paid them, fed them, and sent them to a jihad. Neither did the United States realize what a rich, educated person like Osama bin Laden might later do with the organization that we all had enabled him to establish. The turning point came five years later. By the summer of 1990, the Soviet Union was collapsing, which meant the Mujahideen were now surplus to requirements. But that August, Saddam Hussein decided to invade Kuwait. Once again, the US and Saudi had a shared strategic and economic interest. No mention was made of the now embarrassing overtures Washington had made to Saddam back when he was helping keeping Iran in check. Instead, the US acted with tacit Saudi approval, using language eerily familiar 13 years later. As I report to you, air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations. We are determined to knock out Saddam Hussein's nuclear bomb potential. To disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. And the similarities cannot be dismissed as mere coincidence. The Bush administration was determined to simply to keep the boat on an even keel. After all, it was a boat that the Bush um, family father and son had been riding themselves in the oil business for a very long time. The abandoned rebel fighters now saw a common enemy in Washington and its partner Riyadh, which is why opponents of the ruling family inside Saudi continued to fund and support them. The White House quickly learned of this, but didn't want to rock the boat. The risk to the oil relationship was just too high. So the evidence was hidden. The narrative was changed, and the war on terror looked elsewhere. Bob, you worked with the CIA for some 27 years. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with the thesis that this is blowback from those years of uh, secret coordination between the CIA, the Saudi intelligence, and the Pakistani intelligence? Well, I think that we could in part uh, ascribe 9-11 to blowback uh, from unwise US policies. But the idea that there was official Saudi complicity in in creating the organization which then attacked the United States in the way that, that, that it did, I think is not, I've not seen a shred of evidence there's no, to there, suggest that. There's no accusations that it created the organizations, but it, they are, did coordinate to create the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Oh, yes. And the Arab Afghans that graduated from Afghanistan after the Soviet pullout in 1989 are the ones who founded Al Qaeda. Yes. Hence. Absolutely. So th this this was an <laughs> unintended consequence of a, of a of a previous policy, no question about that. I mean, I've had these conversations with parties all across the Middle East. I was the station chief in, in, in Algiers when uh, Islamists in, in Algeria were organizing that themselves at the time. Ultimately, it produced a civil but war. But blowback does not in involve intended mm -hmm. policies, does it? Blowback by its nature does not necessarily intend no. intended policies. Indeed. But there we there were policies of creating a Vietnam. Another, uh, another Vietnam was sought for the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Well, indeed, uh, we aided the Mujahideen um, during the opening phases of that. I was working on China. Um, I had $600 million in mostly Saudi money to buy Chinese weapons for the Mujahideen. Uh, it's certainly the case that the Mujahideen became a very powerful force, not only in Afghanistan, uh, but in neighboring areas of Pakistan.
and it is certainly the case uh, that um, they were taken advantage of by uh, Osama bin Laden and others, mainly Egyptians, some of whom are still around and uh, to trouble us, um, and uh, that they sponsored 9-11. Uh, what we have is a situation where, for the first time in the history of Islam, for the last 16, 14 centuries, that we have an apocalyptic Islam of this nature that suddenly wants to go on and attack towers two oceans away of, on some mission, of, on some jihad, on some crusade, if will, of some sort that we've never seen before until the question of Afghanistan appeared on the map and Arab Afghans graduated from Afghanistan. But, but I think that the, the intention of, uh, of the U.S., of Saudi Arabia, etc., um, was a, a good intention at the time in, in terms of supporting, uh, supporting the Mujahideen um, a, against the Soviet. And I think the development of Al-Qaeda actually uh, really a, as, a, as a kind of opposition force uh, uh, and, and, and as a, a force for terrorism really develops uh, after that. Uh, because we know that, for example, bin Laden um, wound up um, uh, increasingly breaking relations with the Saudi regime because when he, he looked at the impending first Gulf War, he felt that there should be an Arab Muslim response and that a U.S.-led armada would not only mean that the U.S. would be coming in, but what in fact was the fact, that, that the region would become even more dependent. And I think from that point on, as that estrangement occurs, you begin to see uh, bin Laden not only uh, in a fallout situation with the Saudi government, but it, it becomes, quote, easy to then um, have a fallout with the U.S. because of its close ties with Saudi Arabia, right. and then for the other issues that, that emerge. Osama bin Laden first came to my attention. I was ambassador to Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War, uh, when he objected to the presence of foreign forces in Saudi Arabia. And King Fahad, speaking of him and others like him, described him as a nut. Mm -hmm. Um, not a dangerous nut, but just a nut. Uh, he ended up being thrown out of the kingdom, disowned by his own family, uh, and exiled uh, to Sudan, uh, where he hitched up with the Islamic Jihad of Egypt and began to formulate an ideology uh, which was entirely new. So we have a situation whereby an archangel becomes Lucifer because suddenly the United States became the great Satan. While before that, in the 80s, it was the Soviet Union. But he was then working alongside American CIA and other Saudi intelligence officers in Afghanistan. When he was in Afghanistan, he was very much a marginal figure, not very important. Uh, there was no such thing as al-Qaeda that was formed mm -hmm. much later. Peter? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem with the whole idea of blowback is the United States was a global hegemon with, with interests all over the world being involved with all kinds of things. So it, it's not very hard to find that the U.S. may have been involved in something over here that then may have come out over there. I mean, that has been much of the story of post-Cold War American foreign policy has been the fallout of the Cold War, uh, and, and a, a Cold War in which America uh, did uh, all kinds of things, de dealt with all kinds of very unsavory people who dealt, dealt, did all kinds of bad things to their own societies and in sometimes even ultimately came back to hurt us, but also was doing so in a struggle against uh, a global superpower that, that was, I think, far more malevolent in its ideology than ours. The United States opposed the Soviet expansion into Afghanistan because of Cold War geopolitical considerations, but also out of a devotion at that time to the rule of law and the idea mm -hmm. that large countries should not be allowed to gobble up smaller neighbors. When Iraq invaded Kuwait, the same factors came into play. The United States knew that the Cold War had ended, a new world was beginning, and we did not want that world to begin with the precedent of the sort of aggression that Saddam Hussein conducted. There was also, of course, an element con of concern about oil because we do not want a single country, particularly a malevolent and irresponsible one, like the one that Saddam Hussein represented, to control the world's oil supply. So yes, oil was a consideration, but it wasn't the driving factor. So here we have two countries, a regional power and, and, and an imperial power. They have three things in common, at least. One, a complete hatred to Arab nationalism, secular Arab nationalism, Nasser downwards. Two, a complete hatred to the Iranian Revolution, and three, a complete hatred to communism. So here we have basically strategic partnership, beginning with Afghanistan. Now, 
this might not be, he might be considered a nut, but what I know, and I profiled Osama bin Laden in 1992, what we know is something very simple. There were something called the Arab Afghans. Those were originally financed, grouped, recruited, and sent to Afghanistan through CIA and Saudi financing, or not. The CIA certainly had nothing, no role in recruiting these people in their home countries and sending them to Afghanistan. I mean, they, these people were drawn uh, as if by a magnet to come and, and uh, engage no, in Nor, as far as I know, mm -hmm. Bob, did we uh, ever finance uh, this group. No, it we was financed, financed in Saudi Arabia. We f it was financed mainly by private subscription mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was, during the war against the Soviets, official Saudi assistance directly to some of these groups, yes. Mm -hmm. I think um, but I think um, one of the things that happened immediately after the end of the Soviet intervention was that there was a big effort in Saudi Arabia to prevent further private in, um, uh, donations uh, to uh, some of the worst of these groups. Mm. Uh, so to bring them under control. To bring them under control. Prior to this period of time, in, in many of the countries, Egypt, Algeria, etc., uh, your so-called opposition groups, your so-called extremist opposition groups, your extremist opposition groups, were really opposition groups to their own country. Uh, you know, they might give some lip service to Palestine and Israel or be a little concerned, but they're primarily national groups. Mm -hmm. okay. The transnational di dimension comes in because indeed... How does it come in? Many of them were drawn to the Afghan, both to the Afghan war and then the development of, of a kind of global jihad ideology that dovetailed with their wanting to go to fight. So, th so the genie was out of the bottle after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan and those people returning to their home countries. And suddenly they're well trained, they know how to do explosives, they know how to fight guerrilla warfares, and they're pretty ambitious having been fighting the, uh, the evil empire, the Soviet Union. Now they go back to their countries and they start these little wars. Yes, I, I think the problem with, with the narrative is, is you can't understand the way America makes foreign policy unless you understand that whether it makes sense to you or not, Americans actually often take the, their ideas and their rhetoric about America's role in the world quite seriously. Okay, so explain to me, Peter, why Kuwait, not the Congo? It was the combination of s Kuwait being a country that was more strategically important than the Congo because it had oil. Absolutely, I'm not suggesting that oil is irrelevant to American foreign policy. I don't want to suggest that was the only no, reason. No, but I, but, but I think it's also important that George W. Bush did not, could not have gone on American TV and simply said, George H. W. Bush, we're doing this for oil. There was an American language about how, about the purpose of American power, which helps explain why America goes into countries like Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, which have very little material value whatsoever and so the idea that we were that, that there was something there was a violation of another country's sovereignty which for which was kind of echoed for Americans into the kind of worst days of, of, of what the of what the Nazis had done was very important in the political basis of support for the Gulf War and th there was also a, a great move on the part of the, the Bush Wood administration to, to get a, a broad international sanction for that war uh, it was very very important to them and uh, there were a, s a significant number of Arab countries who also joined uh, that effort, not with a great number of troops and not necessarily with a great deal of popular support at home, but they, they did uh, ally themselves uh, with, with that but effort. But I think part of our problem, you know, is that President Obama talks about a more multilateral approach. And we tend, even if we use the word multilateral, to look like it's unilateral. We become the primary organizers, we become, yes. and even when we get our, our Arab allies on, when you actually look at you know, what they're really giving by way of troops, and then some countries just well, write a check. Well, presumably the new doctrine says no, lo no longer we're taking the lead. On that point, there has been a very sad progression. Uh, the Gulf War to recover, to liberate Kuwait, was a genuine multilateral effort authorized by the Security Council. The invasion of Iraq was a coalition of uh, those who were paid to join the United States. It was not sanctioned by the Security Council. Uh, it was arguably illegal under the UN Charter as a war. So multilateralism has been a big casualty of 9-11 uh, over the succeeding period. Well, let's talk a bit more about the question of how America is perceiving or has perceived 9-11 now 10 years later in retrospect. I think there was a, an enormous visceral emotional response in the United States to 9-11, to the fact that the, this, the, the greatest uh, disaster, the greatest single day loss of life uh, 
in the United States since Pearl Harbor right. uh, had, had suddenly uh, taken place. I, I was in, in Pakistan. In some ways, I never really fully understood that the depth of the emotional response here in my own country. 9-11 created or, or, or helped to create a different fault line in American society that had, begun, that, had been fun, that had been there before. Because it was something that all Americans, particularly native-born Americans, experienced together and that brought the country together. It superimposed upon that, however, a new dividing line, which I think was between native-born Americans and immigrants, with a particular focus on immigrants from, from, the, from the Middle East and the Islamic world. And the struggle about whether, in fact, America should fully include them in its national identity has been a struggle that's been taking place ever since 9-11. Peter, hold, yes, hold that thought. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to take a news break. Mm -hmm. Before we do, we're going to take a look at a quick reminder of the consequences of 9-11 and 9-12 before we come back. We've offered President Bush and the American people our solidarity. It was the day the world changed for everyone. La solidarité de tous les Français. Solidarité. 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 We are completely shocked. The White House had the world's sympathy, but all it wanted was revenge. States like these constitute an axis of evil. We're going to smoke them out. Wanted, dead or alive. The culture of fear was institutionalized. Increased surveillance became commonplace as politicians waited in line to sign the Patriot Act and create the Department of Homeland Security. Green, orange, red. Once innocent colors in the rainbow quickly transformed into a color-coded matrix to warn people of the constant threat level, real or perceived. Code red, prepare for an imminent attack. Websites even started selling gas masks. Basic human rights, cast aside. Uh, using those techniques save lives. And if people didn't comply, their records were simply Redacted. Everyday air travel became a degrading experience. Stripped, scanned, searched from head to toe. The global war on terror came at a high price. $1.3 trillion and counting. Some were quick to capitalize. Light relief in a culture of terror, or the perfect recruiting tool. You look like you're really into this. You guys want a real challenge? For some, it's only a short jump from the console to the drone. The Predator I fly is crucial to our fight against terrorism and protecting lives. Effects have been felt across all aspects of everyday life. And ironically, the one thing that was promised freedom will be defended was the one thing that was taken away. Welcome back. The cost of the war on terror, both in money and in human life, has been staggering. Estimates of civilian deaths in Afghanistan and Iraq begin at a quarter of a million people and could be three times as high. 7,500 U.S. and coalition troops have been killed, tens of thousands injured, while 186,000 are still there. The United States has officially spent $1.3 trillion on the war on terror. Some economists insist the unofficial tally is above $4 trillion. Now, if 9-11 was a terribly dark day for America, 9-12 was terribly worse for America and the rest of the world. There were those who saw it as the justification they had long hoped and planned for a chance in a lifetime to seize the initiative to ensure America's dominance for future generations and in the process, change America and the world forever. <laughs> Knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. And thus, for better or for worse, the Bush Doctrine was explained. Because above all else, what the Bush administration knew it needed was that the 9-11 attacks offered Washington an opportunity to recast global affairs in the way of its choosing. <laughs> 
If that sounds crass, it shouldn't. It's precisely the word the administration used in the first few days after the attack. Through the tears of sadness, I see an opportunity, said George Bush. This is a period not just of grave danger, but of enormous opportunity, echoed Condoleezza Rice. Use of the word opportunity was quickly dropped for reasons of sensitivity, much the way the White House eventually stopped talking of a global crusade. But the opportunities in question were not thought of as a reaction to September 11. They'd been in place for years and just needed a catalyst to set them in motion. There was then, and never has been since, any evidence at all that Saddam Hussein and Iraq were involved with 9-11. I, George Walker Bush. By the time George W. Bush was sworn into office, the authors of the new vision were ready, and men like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld were able to fill the ranks with ideologues who boasted of seeing the world in black and white. We have no regrets about going after bad guys. Who insisted their plan had nothing to do with oil. This confrontation is not and cannot possibly be a moneymaker for the United States. And who simply dismissed anyone with a different point of view. No American should think we're free, the war's over, Al Qaeda's not coming, and they're not interested in getting us, because that's wrong. Many of these men were the now infamous neocons, whose new American vision was built around three uncompromising elements. First, traditional diplomacy, as represented by the United Nations, was dead. The United States would now simply operate on its own terms. The organization is incapable of playing a helpful role in the region. Second, American policy toward Israel would become even more sympathetic. The neocons endorsed a hardline vision toward the Palestinians and the region as a whole. The third element of the neocon vision was to focus as much attention as possible on the Middle East. The goal was to transform the region in one dramatic sweep to send a signal to the rest of the world that the United States was to remain the sole undisputed superpower. These three elements were central to the plan devised years before 9-11, and as a result, explain why the administration reacted so quickly and decisively after the attacks, in a way that made so little sense to the rest of the world, and indeed, to members of the administration itself who didn't follow the neocon vision. On the very night of 9-11, while even they were still thinking that maybe more planes were coming, there was a high-level meeting at the White House, and during it, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld said, to the amazement of some of the people sitting there, people like the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld said, we've got to do Iraq. This grand plan explains both the decision to invade Afghanistan and then Iraq. It explains why Guantanamo Bay was established and why the cruelties of Abu Ghraib were allowed to continue unchecked for so long. It explains why the neocons hand-picked Iraqi leader was jettisoned by the Iraqi people the first chance they got. It explains the abstract reasoning for the war on terror and why sympathetic leaders like Tony Blair were quick to endorse it. This is why the administration first spoke in terms of opportunities. All the neocons needed was an event to trigger the plan and a president willing to follow it to the letter. Bob. 9-11 was an opportunity. I felt at the time that it was an opportunity. I was somebody who had devoted much of my career to counterterrorism. And here suddenly, it, it, it's, it's it maybe hard to remember this now, but in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there was a tremendous um, uh, uptick in, in sympathy and support for the United States. I mean, we saw it all around Huge. the world, less so in the Muslim world, perhaps, mm. but, but even there as mm. well. And there was a feeling on the part of many of us, and I think this is what is being reflected in these statements that are being quoted in this film clip, is that now we really have an opportunity to galvanize an international coalition against this phenomenon of terrorism. This idea that that national or sub even subnational groups can uh, can forward their political agenda through indiscriminate attacks on civilians. That, that is is the the, the the very definition of uncivilized behavior. If we as a, a national, a, rather an international community can do something about this now, this is a tremendous opportunity. I think where the, where the administration lost its opportunity was in the way that it chose to pursue its policy. I remember the day after 9-11, a friend of mine from the Arab world wrote to me and said, it's terrible what happened, and of course, you'll want to go in to get bin Laden. But we wonder whether this is the beginning 
or the end. Mm -hmm. You know, will this become an excuse for America to redraw <coughs> the map of the Middle East? Well, you know, if you if you look at newamericancentury.com and you look at the people who were behind that kind of ball game, what what then wound up happening was the pursuit of terrorism looked too much the way in which we then went at it looked too much like quote or at least was perceived in the region as a war against Islam. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the advocacy of promoting democracy really never really took off. You know, that is when, whenever there was a, a real opportunity, the Bush administration folded, whether it, whether it had to do with dealing with Egypt, dealing with Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. etc. And I think in, part exactly because, they, in part because in the, in the Arab world, very often, the opposition is Islamist. Mm -hmm. um, there's a contradiction. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, you can't be for democracy <laughs> um, and against those who argue for it in that in those societies. That the great contradiction of our policy on Hamas is, okay. is and I think the, there, was, there was a there was a very uh, a, a very naive view that if democracy emerged in the in, in the Middle East, that the people who would win those elections would be people who essentially supported American foreign policy, which I think was based on an extraordinary kind of ignorance of actually the dynamics, but it was self-serving. I think the metaphor of the Cold War, the, the, the analogy of the Cold War was extremely important in how American foreign policy makers defined their response to 9-11. The, the, the world Cold War had, was seen in, had been tidied up as a, a complete victory, as a kind of a pure struggle, the anal analog to, to World War II, and there was almost a yearning among some for America to find a new sense of purpose, the kind that we had had during those great struggles. What would be this new generation's great sense of purpose? It came at a time uh, where the confidence in the American military was sky high after the successes in, in Bosnia and Kosovo and the apparent success early on in Afghanistan that led us then to Iraq, so, and also in which America's ideological self-confidence was massively high because of the spread of democracy. All those things were so very hubris, important. Then, that's what we're talking about. Absolutely, because hubris born in part of the extraordinary success that America had had in the period since the end of but the war. But there also, was also a... Also so we if I just, we're trying to understand these elements. So help us understand why America would go on and invade Iraq when Iraq had absolutely no connection to Al-Qaeda or to 9-11. Because, Al because Iraq had been a festering problem for American foreign policy since the end of the Gulf War, because the Gulf War had been meant to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and to everyone's surprise, he stayed in power. And as the history and, and the sanctions regime was crumbling. It could not sustain itself forever. So America had a problem. The problem was, do you essentially let Saddam out of his box. Uh, now, now, our image of how powerful he was was dramatically exaggerated, but even the Clinton administration people thought that was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But they also began to realize that the sanctions regime was untenable. But, so that's, but what is that? And then, that's an imperial I, thinking, I, isn't I, it? Well, I, it, I, was an, it was, you could call it imperial if you want to. America was a great power which had a concern about Saddam Hussein, who had been someone who I, we, want, we believe wanted to essentially so you become think, a hegemon so, of his own in the Middle so, East. So you think if Saddam Hussein had a problem with America and its, and its ambition and so on, so they should took on George Bush? No, I no, no, I think the Iraq war was a grave mistake. I'm just trying to explain to you why there I think it happened. There was a, there was a, a simple explanation mm -hmm. for Iraq, which you could hear out in the hinterland. And the theory was this, 9-11 was done by Arabs, bad Arabs. The baddest Arab of them all is Saddam Hussein. Therefore, it's appropriate to go after him. That was the chain of logic. It was that stupid. It was a justification but what, but that for vengeance against Saddam Hussein. It's total nonsense. But that uh, is the way you, you know, many you, you know the Arab world well enough to know that the nature of the Saddam regime was as such. Of course. No. In a totalitarian republic, that if they hated anyone, it would be an Islamist non-state actor of course. acting of course. transnationally. I mean, no, I don't, I don't think, I think anybody at the table will argue that um, the Bush uh, justifications for attacking Iraq had any validity at all. But it's important all. to remember that America was going to war with Iraq. I mean, we did major missile attacks on Iraq in 1998. Yeah. Before, now, without 9-11, there would never have been the political support to, to attack Iraq. Mm. That's absolutely right. But, but to suggest that essentially the, the, this, the, the engagement with Saddam Hussein came out of the blue is not, America had an ongoing, essentially, military struggle with Saddam Hussein that was going throughout the 90s. The Gulf War never ended. There was no, exactly. no there was no Indeed. termination strategy exactly. for it. There was no negotiation. There was no agreed adjustment of relationships between us and Iraq. And Peter's right; it festered. 
most Americans imagine that we won a great victory in the Cold War. We defeated the Soviet exactly. Union. Actually, the Soviets defaulted. They defaulted. Exactly. Exactly. They imploded. But our mistake, exactly. which led us to feel that we were, we were omnipotent, that we could do anything we wanted, that we had infinite resources and capabilities, parallels the Islamist mistake in the interpretation of Afghanistan. They imagined that it was a combination of Islam and their guerrilla tactics uh, that freed Afghanistan of the mm -hmm. Soviet Union and that brought the Soviet Union down. That was a grotesque exaggeration of what actually happened. In fact, out of the debacles of Afghanistan and the Cold War and out of the debacles of the invasion of Iraq, what we have is Arabs have been suffering nonstop because of those policies. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, I was asked to meet with an Assistant Secretary of State at the s on the same day that I signed a contract for a book called The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality, mm -hmm. which I had conceived of when I was looking at the first Gulf War. And it was clear, you know, when I met with this person, he said, no, I don't see Islam as a global threat or the Muslim world, but it was, is Algeria another Iran? No matter how you tried to explain that it wasn't because of the trauma. And then the next line was, but you know, when you look around the world for an ideological alternative or threat, Islam poses that potential threat. Now you fast forward to the Bush administration, and if you look at many of the neocons in his administration, Wolfowitz and others, they believed, and, and, and we know that this is the way uh, Rumsfeld felt, that Iraq had to go, that Saddam had to go, and, and they, they, they actually needed an excuse but then it worked into a nice belief to say this can become the launching pad for promoting democracy, yeah. but it was a neo-imperialist approach to promoting democracy, yeah. you know, because we're going to get our own guy. And one okay. of the factors that people miss also is that there was a fear, not just a naive tale about how governments might go. The real fear that Mubarak and the rest of them played on was you've now seen what can happen with terrorists, okay? Therefore, you give us aid, we use it any way we want, and any opposition we have, religious, secular, mainstream or not, just realize if it's not us, okay, what's going to come after us? And those became driving forces that then I think, you know, really continue to distort the way in which we then have continued to deal with uh, issues in Pakistan, Afghanistan, But John, but John you, don't, you don't really think that America was naive to believe these things, that if it's not Mubarak, then it is the Al-Qaeda, or if it's not Gaddafi, it's the Al-Qaeda. I, I can't say America. I can Certainly say, the CIA was intelligent enough to know that it's that not true. You know, we spent an awful lot of money on uh, intelligence analysis. I won't talk about covert action or uh, the collection of intelligence, but just intelligence analysis. Uh, we missed the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, we misunderestimated, to use George Bush's word, uh, the Vietnamese. Um, we <laughs> didn't foresee the collapse of the Soviet Union. We didn't foresee Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. We missed the Arab Spring. <coughs> Why is it that anyone should imagine that we would have an intelligent analysis that informed our policy during all this period? It's full of mistakes. Well, I didn't of say judgment. anything. He, it, was, <laughs> it was the ambassador. It was the ambassador. It. We're cutting much. Yeah. It's, it's the state CIA <laughs> thing all over again. Here we go. <laughs> First of all, 9 11 should not have come as a complete surprise. I mean, Bin Laden, he was not known by many people, but there were certainly people within the U.S. government who knew of him. Uh, it was very clear that he and his organization were, were responsible for the, the attacks on our embassies in, in East Africa. We all knew that it was not a matter of whether, but of when the next attack would occur. Now, no, nobody that I know imagined the scope of the, of the attack when it came. But I think that the heart of the Bush Doctrine was that when we know that there is an incipient threat out there, we will take effective uh, preemptive. preemptive action in order to deal with it. And here, as Peter has pointed out here, we, we had this festering problem in Iraq, much greater in scope than anything that we would have anticipated from Al Qaeda that we weren't dealing with. But they it's also, I think, one, one important part is that it's very important to understand that the mentality of the Bush people was to denigrate the importance of non state actors. They were very inclined to believe, essentially, to denigrate the idea that Al Qaeda essentially could be significant without state sponsorship and to look for state sponsorship. And I think that's part of the reason they were essentially grasping for straws at state sponsorship in Iraq and not only Iraq, other there. places too, when in fact there really wasn't. It sounds to me that the Bush doctrine is is cut and paste from the Israel's doctrine of preemptive. I remember uh, an Israeli historian by the name of Tom Segev wrote a piece of the New York Times saying, whatever you do, don't do what we do, because we don't seem to get out of what we are in, which is the torture, the preemptive strikes, military occupation of lands, 
and so on and so forth. But it seems that the Bush administration has taken on the Israeli doctrine step by step. Is mm -hmm. that I, intelligent? I think there is some truth to that and there's some ways in which it's very wrong. I think it is true that the sense of extreme vulnerability that, that, that defined neoconservative vision. And it wasn't just in post-Cold War. It was very much a function of their view of the Cold War. If you look at these guys during the Cold War, they were always of the view that America was about to lose, that, that the Soviets were so much stronger. That notion of extreme vulnerability was similar to the extreme vulnerability that's defined Israeli strategy. Peter, because Israel is a very small Peter, country. But just, let me finish. So just okay, yes. You just told us that after Clinton, by the year 2000, 2001, America was yes, so confident. But that's America because, but the, so irony is because the irony America is, so is that the, the more power you have, the more you can afford to see threats that are not so great as apocalyptic because you believe you have the power to solve them. If you have a gun and, as opposed to having a knife, you're more willing to go after the bear. But I, but I just want to make one point because I think it's important for your listeners. To say that, to say that there was a conceptual similarity, is not to say that the people who defined Bush administration foreign policy went into Iraq because they, because they thought it was good for Israel. Sure. I think that it's absolutely incorrect. And if you look at the individuals, I think, in fact, the role of Israel in their thinking for many of them was really quite marked. If it was up to Israel, they should have invaded Iran. Exactly. But, but anyway, the the, the Israelis were very pessimistic no. about what would happen after Saddam well, fall. Is it intelligent for a superpower to borrow the doctrine from a small what some would it, call it, a rogue state. It's, it's very strange. After the end of the Cold War, the United States suffered from what I call uh, enemy deprivation syndrome, which is the queasy feeling you have when you don't have an enemy anymore, and you've built a huge apparatus and intellectual superstructure to deal with a, with a sense of omnipotent threat. So you look around for enemies. Second, uh, in this context, uh, the situation of Israel uh, is totally different from that of the United States. It is a very small country with a very limited margin for error, uh, which has consistently followed a doctrine of preemptive strikes because it doesn't believe in deterrence, uh, because it doesn't believe it has the luxury of, of, of testing the, the feasibility of deterrence. The United States is a vastly powerful country behind two oceans. There is no existential threat to the United States whatsoever. The only threat to us is from ourselves, our own corrosion of our own values. Certainly the military expenditures have skyrocketed with new expenditures for the security affairs. Is this another case of a conflict creating demand for yet more military industrial expenditures? It is true that, that there, there is a, a big industry, if you will, that has grown up, uh, which is supplying services, training, uh, uh, other services to the intelligence and the defense communities. Uh, and I think it's simply because this is a, a, a very complicated world. Uh, much of this struggle that we've been talking about uh, is intelligence driven. There, there is a tremendous amount of expertise that really cannot be uh, developed solely within the U.S. government. But, but there is no, the no zero-sum mm -hmm. game here. I mean, it's not that mm -hmm. the security and the intelligence Mm -hmm. is rising and the other expenditure, the hardware, is, is, I, is softening. Think, oh no, They're both rising. I think yes, this goes because back we, we've been fighting both types of war. This goes back to your question of, about Israeli strategic doctrine and our adoption of that mode of reasoning. The neoconservative argument is both a moral one and, a, and, and an expedient one. Uh, they believe we won a great, huge victory in the Cold War. It left us globally supreme in a military sense. Uh, they think from that follow two principles. First, <coughs> if you are globally all-powerful, you have a responsibility to use your power to change the world for the better, as you see it. Second, you should hang on to that superiority at all costs. We but were also <laughs> driven by a, a, a history, a, a recent history, and a belief that we are number one and it's important that we remain number one. Okay, so we used to think of ourselves as number one politically, economically, and militarily. Well, the economic is clear, not there. And e even before, it was clear that, you know, uh, there, there were other rising forces. But there's an inherent belief that, you know, if you have a huge military, you're also then going to be seeing and will have tremendous clout and influence internationally politically and but, and, but, and but John this is an amazing and we, we tend to think that statement. bigger is better so even so if we don't say to ourselves do we have a bloated uh, let's say uh, uh, in, intelligence community or military you know can we cut back can we can we do it less 
we tend to think it's part of our culture. You know, bigger is better. I mean, we're, we're that's the way we so, think so, of so things. So what you're saying, what you're telling us is that the Pentagon is now, or has been for a while now, certainly for many years, an instrument to advance American interests. And since the Cold War, it remains to be so. And because it's big and because it's there, then why not use it? I think also what happened was, but the, but the that's, that's a dangerous notion. The story of American, the story of America's uh, success in the Cold War. Let's not call it victory. Um, and even in World War II, was told particularly by the Bush administration as a story of military success. It was almost as imagined as if we had actually defeated the Soviet Union on the field of battle. Exactly. And that I think was particularly important in this vision of essentially, well, how do we how do we win our next Cold War? Essentially, by through military strength. What was lost was that was the recognition that America's real ace in the hole both against the Nazis and against the Soviets, had been the, our industrial power. Our ability to outproduce the Nazis, and then our ability to have a stable, dynamic economy when the Soviets couldn't. And it was that story about that kind of American success and preeminence that I think was really lost, and as the military one took, took, took center stage. Guess what, Peter? This is actually our next Empire episode is about. Uh -huh. Gentlemen, thank you for joining Empire. Thank you. And thank I'll you. be back with the last thoughts. The Arabs have been pressured over the last decade to make a choice between Bush and bin Laden. And choose they did, a revolution, one that negates their visions and underlines their failures. But that didn't prevent Al-Qaeda and Washington to jump on the bandwagon of people's power and express their support for the revolutions sweeping through the region in the hope of influencing their outcome. This is bad news, considering that the Arab and Muslim worlds have long suffered from Al-Qaeda's apocalyptic terrorism and Washington's imperial wars. Unlike Al-Qaeda, America is no runaway rogue group. It is an old constitutional democracy with vibrant public opinion that needs to ensure Arab democracies are not held hostage to the war on terror. And that's the way it goes. Write to me with your suggestions. Until next time.